If you're anything like me, then you've probably gazed up at the world's massive cruise ships and thought to yourself, how do these things stay up? Oceans cover over 70% of the Earth's surface. Weather systems can make them harsh, dangerous, and unpredictable. Ships traversing the ocean can be subjected to strong winds, brutal storms, and even rogue waves. So as ships over the centuries have grown bigger and taller, and even taller, what has prevented them from tipping over at all? Surely there must be a point when a ship could become too tall to stay upright except in the calmest of seas. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to take a look at the science behind shipbuilding and answer the question, how do big ships stay upright? Simply put, the reason ships are able to stay upright is really down to simple physics and engineering. Well, video finished. Thanks so much for watching. Just kidding. Specifically, a ship's center of gravity and a ship's buoyancy prevented from falling over. Now, the center of gravity is the point at which the entire weight of a body may be considered as concentrated. So if it's supported at this point, the body would remain in equilibrium in any position. Now, buoyancy is the tendency of a body to float or to rise when submerged in a fluid. In the ship's case, this is, of course, water. Now, while in the water, the weight of a ship acts through the ship's center of gravity, which is then counteracted through a center of buoyancy. It sounds complicated, but we'll explain it. As a ship floats upright in the water, its upright position is held in place thanks to a delicate balance between the vessel's center of gravity and its center of buoyancy. To maintain this cohesion of scientific properties, designers and architects have to carefully manage the ship's center of gravity. Now, this does not occur by some happy accident. It's achieved by strategically placing the heaviest components in the lowest part of the ship. Now, this can include the machinery, like the engines, fuel, and so on. The engineered low center of gravity helps counterbalance the weight pulling the ship downwards, which effectively prevents it from tipping over. Now, the center of buoyancy is the point where the buoyancy acts upwards on the ship. This physical force is determined by the volume of water that the ship actually displaces. When ship designers ensure that the ship's center of gravity is below the center of buoyancy, the vessel remains upright, even if it's subjected to rolling waves, which is, of course, a common occurrence for all ships. Of course, it's one thing to understand scientific concepts like the center of gravity and buoyancy as they appear on paper, but it's a completely different thing to actually apply it to shipbuilding. You can't simply put together a watertight hull and expect it to stay upright, no matter the conditions. Careful considerations have to be taken. As time has gone on, new technology and design discoveries have allowed shipbuilding to become a more finely tuned and effective craft. Shipbuilding has been around for a very long time. In fact, it goes all the way back to the earliest days of humankind, and it's thought that the earliest recovered boat dates from around about 8200 to 7600 BC. The people from this time didn't have much science to guide them at all, so it's thought that some of the earliest boat builders, like those from Egypt and Mesopotamia, probably developed basic hull shapes based on simple trial and error. If it floated, success. If not, well, dry off and then start again. Now, thousands of years later, a scientific breakthrough came. In the third century BC, the Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, astronomer, inventor, and all-around legend, Archimedes, discovered something very profound. Now, he devised that a body at rest in a fluid is acted upon by a force pushing upward, of course called the buoyant force. Now, this is equal to the weight of the fluid that the body displaces. If the body's completely submerged, the volume of fluid displaced is equal to the volume of the body. This discovery is at the heart of all modern ship design to this day. Despite Archimedes discovering what's essentially a guiding principle in shipbuilding, early application and understanding of it was pretty slow. A critical element of the Archimedes principle is that size and building material are not relevant in objects being able to float at all. As long as the buoyant force remains equal to the weight of the fluid that the ships displace, it will float. Yet for hundreds and even thousands of years after Archimedes' discovery, ships continued to be built out of wood. Yes, it's obviously a readily available material, which made it a natural choice in shipbuilding, but the fact is that it was naturally buoyant, and that was a leading reason why ship architects and designers continued to use it. In fact, even as recently as the 18th century and early 19th century, a sailor's saying went, wood can swim and iron cannot. 
Now, iron ships were proven feasible in 1787 when John Wilkinson built the first floating metal boat, a 70-foot barge constructed of iron plates. Although shipbuilders and engineers gradually began to understand the Archimedes principle better with time, they still sometimes got it wrong. As history has shown, if the guiding principles aren't well adhered to, there will be consequences. Now, some might just result in an unflattering nickname, while others may lead to instant capsizing with just the slightest breeze. Now, for example, the SS Imperator of the Hamburg America Line. We've talked about her before. She was supposed to be the pride of the German Merchant Navy. After the time of her completion in 1913, she was the largest ship in the world, stealing the title from the White Star Line's Olympic. She had open interior spaces, plenty of natural ventilation and light for many cabins, even a Ritz-Carlton restaurant. She also had something else, a distinguishable list in the water. After a maiden voyage across the Atlantic, harbour pilot Captain George Seed noticed something when he was assigned to bring her into the Ambrose Channel. The ship would list from side to side when the helm changed, and she was soon nicknamed the Limperator. Now, only four months after her triumphant maiden voyage, the Imperator was brought back to the Vulcan shipyard in Germany for some drastic work. It had been determined that her center of gravity was too high. She was not adhering to that perfect balance of gravity and buoyancy. Now, this was obviously quite uncomfortable because it meant the ship was listing from side to side, but it could also prove extremely dangerous. So in an attempt to correct the problem, the marble bathroom suites in first class were removed to reduce the weight, and heavy furniture pieces were replaced with lighter, wicker cane ones. Now, the ship's three funnels were also cut down by over nine feet each. And lastly, 2,000 tons of cement was poured into the ship's double bottom to act as ballast. Now, while these dramatic and costly measures did improve her stability, the Imperator never truly lost her list and her undesirable nickname. Now, that being said, even though she may have been swaying back and forth in the waves, at least she was still able to float above them, unlike this next ship. The Swedish warship Vasa very famously set off on her maiden voyage in 1628 and made it about three quarters of a mile before encountering a slight gust of wind. Now, embarrassingly and tragically, she tipped over and sank immediately in front of tens of thousands of curious spectators. Now, we've actually covered this disaster in a lot more detail in the past. It's estimated that around 30 people perished in the sinking. There's no denying that she was simply way too top heavy and unstable. In fact, many of her designers and builders knew it at the time. The ship's upper works were simply too tall and heavy relative to the amount of hull that sat beneath the waterline. She had way too many heavy guns across her two gun decks. She had accidentally been designed to fail. Now, this is a good indicator of what happens when design, for whatever reason, goes wrong. While mistakes were clearly made in various degrees in the design of both Imperator and Vasa, it's important to note that these are outliers and that the vast majority of other ships have been designed to survive even the most dangerous of encounters. It's testament to the engineering behind large ships that some of the world's largest and most impressive have encountered some very, very terrifying conditions at sea and come out on top. Now, this is especially true of some of Cunard Line's most famous ocean liners, which encountered some of the worst conditions at sea, specifically rogue waves. If anything was going to tip a ship over, it would be them. Now, both vessels were well designed and prepared to take on exactly this kind of incident. In December 1942, the Queen Mary, then serving as a troop ship, was carrying over 11,000 soldiers and crew. 1,100 kilometres or 700 miles off the coast of Scotland, Queen Mary was caught in a gale. Suddenly, she was broadsided by a rogue wave on her starboard side. Now, the estimate is that the wave may have reached the height of 92 feet or 28 metres. The wave smashed windows and the ship began to roll. The rush of incoming water caused her to list heavily it's estimated that she may have listed as much as 52 degrees, and may have only been another three degrees or so from capsizing completely. Now, despite carrying more passengers and crew than ever intended, which might have created a higher than normal center of gravity, the ship's designers prevailed. While she was held hard over onto her side, the crew of the engine room quickly opened ballast flooding valves to double bottom tanks on the other side of the ship. She slowly righted herself and eventually came to full recovery after about 10 minutes. There were injuries and damage to the ship and her interiors, but she continued along her journey. The time spent working on the Queen Mary's centre of gravity and buoyancy saved tens of thousands of people that day. Now, there's got to be some cosmic connection with Cunard liners and rogue waves, because over five decades later, another similar event happened. 
In September 1995, the QE2 was sailing 200 miles off of Newfoundland, heading towards New York. She'd been trying unsuccessfully to avoid Hurricane Lewis. Captain Ronald Warwick was on the bridge when he noticed a huge wave looming off the bow. Now, Warwick later described it as it looked as if the ship was heading for the White Cliffs of Dover. Ironically, it was estimated that the wave was also around 92 feet high, about the same size as the one that had hit the Queen Mary years earlier. The wave broke with tremendous force over QE2's bow, sending an incredible shudder through the ship. She dropped down and was subsequently hit by a second wave behind the first one. Up against this terrible weather system, the QE2's design held strong, with no reported injuries despite all the odds. The technology to keep these massive ships upright only continues to evolve and improve, aiming to not only keep passengers safe, but more comfortable as well. Now, adhering to Archimedes' principle does not just happen by chance by ship designers and architects. It takes a lot of thought and planning to make sure any ship can stay upright. Of course, ships are only getting bigger. They need to hold more passengers and more cargo. Cruise ships need to be safe as well as comfortable with room for all the modern amenities cruise passengers expect. The very design of a ship is quintessential in promoting stability. Now, most modern ships either have a U-shaped or a displacement hull. They're constructed from materials that are both lightweight and sturdy and have a broad, deep bottom. The shape disperses the forces acting upon it evenly, which ensures that the ship remains balanced. The hull displaces water outwards and downwards. As the water tries to fill the space, the energy pushes the ship upwards. This is the Archimedes principle in action. It's known as the first condition of equilibrium. Now, something unique to ship travel is that conditions can vary greatly from voyage to voyage. A paved road more or less feels the same, but the sea's conditions can change hour by hour. So it's not enough that a ship stays upright in just ideal conditions. They have to stay buoyant in all kinds of weather patterns. Now, fortunately, a ship's center of gravity can be moved up or down by adjusting weights within the vessel. Now, the two most common ways of doing this is by adjusting the fuel levels and water in the ballast tanks. Ballast tanks are precisely designed within the ship's framework. By managing the intake and outflow of water in the ballast tanks while sailing, the ship's stability can be fine-tuned and adjusted as needed. For example, if a ship's caught in a bad storm and it's leading hard over to the port side, ballast tanks on the starboard side of the ship can be filled to restore stability. In extreme conditions, measures like emptying the swimming pools to reduce weight can be taken to help get a ship back upright. With ships being as modern as they are these days, adjustments can often be managed dynamically by the crew using all of the vessel's onboard systems. Arguably, and I'll certainly be one to make this argument, there is nothing more pretty or majestic a sight than a tall ship sitting in the water. Today, ships continue to grow to feature more luxuries, more amenities, and carry even more people than before. But despite being larger and heavier than before, these vessels can float comfortably through all weather conditions. New safety features and technology will continue to be developed and added in all vessels' constructions. Now, these advancements will definitely make ships safer and more comfortable. And when each new ship is launched and it takes to the water and sits upright all by itself, we owe it all to Archimedes' discovery over 2,000 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.